technical presentations with national, uh, we are continuing our sustainability conversations with national technical presentations from technical experts. And today we have Mr. Jonathan Kelly from the St. Kitts Electricity Company, Skelec. We will also have a presentation from Mr. Ian Ward of the Nevis Electricity Company, Nevlek. And we will have one other presentation from Mr. Josiah Burkett from the Ministry of Sustainable Development. And I'll go right into Mr. Kelly's presentation. Here you go. All right. Thank you, thank you very much, Ms. Laplace. Good morning, good morning all here, and good morning those who will be following us via um, streaming media. Welcome to the St. Kitts Nevis Pavilion here at COP28 here in Dubai, UAE. And today, as Ms. Laplace said, we're going to be focusing on the energy transition of, of St. Kitts and Nevis. Now, the thematic <coughs> outlook and thematic focus for today is that of energy, industry, and just transition. So we're going to start off the presentation by giving an overview of the energy sector in St. Kitts and Nevis. And then we're going to introduce the energy sector trajectory. And then Ian will come and go on a deeper dive into some of the more technical details. St. Kitts and Nevis is the smallest sovereign nation in the Western Hemisphere. With a population of just approximately 47,000 plus persons, its economy is primarily driven by tourism, industry, small light manufacturing, and financial services. It has a shared currency with other OECS countries called the Eastern Caribbean dollar. Verdant, lush, green foliage, blue skies, and it is a very beautiful country to visit. The energy use per capita is estimated to just be approximately 4.3 megawatt hours per person per year. But how is this energy presently produced? Well, largely dependent on imported fossil fuels, both for the electricity sector and the transportation sector. And we are aware that the reason why we're here at COP is to really look at how we can avert and slow down climate change, which we have already been able to identify has direct linkages to the use of fossil fuels. So therefore, St. Kitts and Nevis, when we look at with the graphic presented here, we can see that most of the emissions are as a result of that being utilized for electricity generation and also for heat and transport. The government presently subsidizes fossil fuel for electricity generation. And the dependency on imported fossil fuels therefore exposes our market to the volatilities of the external markets of the import of fossil fuels. This is very a negative externality to our energy security. When we look at it in terms of energy generation for electricity, you can see presently 97% of electricity is being generated using diesel oil in burned in diesel generators. So our conversation today is going to be talking about, well, how are we going to transition away from this over time? The electricity sector, Nevis and St. Kitts, presently are independent of each other. You have the two utilities vertically integrated under the various ministries, as identified here, separated electricity grids. But then part of the sustainability transition is going to look at how we can unify these electricity grids. And this presentation today, both between Skellig and Nevlek, is already um, segueing and beginning to present an overarching architecture of what this unified grid is going to look like. When we look at it in terms of the future projections of energy demand for the Federation, we can see that there is growth that is going to be projected over the long-term period. We can see, of course, Nevis is slightly smaller than St. Kitts, and on average, annually, it's burning about, requiring about 60 gigawatt hours of electricity. And whereas, comparatively, St. Kitts is about 174. 
And the graphic here demonstrates that over time, as we see, as we trend toward 2045, or even if we look in a more near term by 2030, we can see the peak demand of, of saying it's in averaging about 40 megawatts, and that of, of Nevis reaching the words of about 20 megawatts. But of course, we expect that as we start to diversify the energy sector, it's going to attract more industries, which are going to be more energy intensive, that is going to even further drive this demand upward. But the government has embarked on a sustainable island state agenda, of which there are seven pillars. And fundamentally, we know that energy is necessary for any sort of socioeconomic activity. Therefore, let us focus on the green energy transition, which has been identified as one of the pillars for the Sustainable Island State Agenda. Minister Conris Maynard, the Minister of Public Infrastructure, Energy and Utilities at AL, has said, the government is committed to transforming St. Kitts and Nevis into a sustainable island state, utilizing key strategies to significantly boost the utilization of renewable energy sources across the country. Our NDCs and renewable energy targets 100% renewable energy to be utilized for electricity generation by 2030. We're in the year 2023. So that shows in the next seven years, we're going to be very ambitious and very bold and very determined towards meeting these targets. And when Ian comes to speak, he's going to outline one of the major interventions towards making these targets. Our revised NDCs identified a change of 61% reduction against in, in total um, CO2 emissions against the 2010 base year. And all sectors will be focusing on energy and power generation and transportation for the achievement of the indices. So when we look at this graphic, what we can see, uh, energy consumption for the Federation can primarily be um, disaggregated into two main sectors, electricity generation and use, and also in the transport sector. The graphic also demonstrates that the resources that we have identified for utilization for the transition are geothermal, solar, wind, and also waste or biomass. Energy efficiency, of course, is one of those pillars that also has to be considered as we go forward, we have to be able to look at how we can use energy more efficiently. So therefore, we can see the use of um, energy efficient equipment, automation of high consumption equipment, and also the implementation of smart metering and other such um, technologies. In the transport sector, of course, there's going to be the introduction of electric vehicles, and we'll speak more about that. So when the utilities, both Skelec and Nevlek, which are at the forefront of this energy transition, we have a balancing act. Because while we're making the transition, on a day-to-day -day basis, the people of St. Kitts and Nevis require instantaneous power and energy for their continuous daily socioeconomic functions. We cannot say to persons, unfortunately, there is no electricity available because there is no sun shining at this time, there is no wind blowing. So we have to be looking at the combination of different resources, first of all, to ensure energy security. We have to look at low carbon technologies and renewable energy technologies. Energy efficiency plays a very important role because while producing energy, we have to look at and ensure that there are no wastages of energy in waste being consumed. The liberalized cost of energy has to also be considered. We have to ensure that persons can afford the actual electricity for their daily lives. The technology choice cannot be one that is going to exacerbate and increase the cost of electricity that persons cannot afford electricity. We have to give consideration to the financing and the cost of capital for any sort of technological intervention. And in the transition has to be just and equitable. All persons, of course, must be able to have fear and able access to electricity. And they also have to be consideration for those persons who are employed in the sector who presently depend on fossil fuel employment. There is a consideration for dispatchability. When it is needed, it has to be readily available. 
And of course, it has to be resilient to climate change, preferably, especially when we look at it, we are prone to severe storms every few months, every year. And the technology choice has to be resilient to that and able to provide electricity even during storm conditions or shortly after storm conditions have passed, be able to restore power to the entire nation. So with all these things being considered, we have already identified the four main indigenous energy resources for development, of which geothermal has the greatest potential. Geothermal has highest potential in terms of power and energy density, dispatchability, availability, and it is resilient to severe weather events. A geothermal plant can remain operational during a severe weather event, and it can basically be restored shortly after, even if it has to be, um, the grid has to be taken off just for the passage of a, a hurricane, for example. It has a reduced levelized cost of energy compared to fossil fuels. Geothermal also is going to play a very significant role in the transport sector transition. We can see in the years to come, 2030 going up towards 2045, there's going to be a significant increase in the number of electric vehicles in the islands of St. Kitts and Nevis. Electric vehicles, therefore, will require electricity for the charging as we begin to transition away from fossil fuels in the transport sector. The varying time frames in which persons, depending on their lifestyles, will require this energy, it means that the strategy for provision of this energy has to be well thought. Of course, there's provision and inclusion of energy storage, but most importantly, having a reliable and resilient form of energy enables this transition. And therefore, geothermal is, is this particular resource that is being looked at. And geothermal has many direct and indirect utilizations and impacts. It can be used to attract and facilitate energy intensive industries such as crypto mining, and it can create jobs and facilitate economic growth. Green fuels such as ammonia and hydrogen can be produced and it can be used for space heating, cooling, and industrial processes. So with this said, where are we as of today, December 5th, 2023, in terms of the St. Kitts and Nevis energy transition? Well, we've already identified the Sustainable Island State Agenda. We also have already had the federal government has passed legislature for the federal development of the geothermal resource in Nevis. There's a 2.2 megawatt wind farm in Nevis which was commissioned in 2010. And also, just a few days ago, a revised PPA was signed for 35 megawatt a utility scale a solar PV project in St. Kitts, which will also include 44 megawatt hour energy storage. So what this is showing is St. Kitts and Nevis is very determined and it is very much on its way towards making that sustainability transition in the energy sector. But we have to give considerations for the transition to be just and equitable. As we said before, there are persons whose lives and livelihoods depend on employment right now and technologies that are dependent on fossil fuels. Both at Neblek and at Skellig, we have staff who are highly trained, highly experienced and skilled in diesel power generator maintenance and operation. So in making the transition, we have to give consideration as to for their livelihoods as well and how they are going to be justly and equitably included in this transition. And what this essentially means is that we have to do reskilling, retraining, repurposing of, of our staff to be able to ensure that no one is ever left behind. Persons will be sent and trained for example, on geothermal plant maintenance and operation, and we will be able to have persons trained in, in solar PV installation and maintenance. And essentially, their lives and, and their livelihoods and their jobs will be secure for the long term and for the future. And of course, new jobs and spin-offs from the RE industry, both for men and women, will be created. So in summary, the Sustainable Island State Agenda of St. Kitts and Nevis aims to decarbonize the energy sector while ensuring energy security to transform the socio-economic outlook through the exploitation of indigenous sustainable energy resources. 
Geothermal energy will be the primary driver for a just, equitable energy sector decarbonization strategy. A unified, resilient one grid for the Federation powered by renewable energy will be a game changer for the socioeconomic activities and transport sector transition to e-mobility. Now with this said, Ian will now come and do a deeper dive into the other elements of this transition. Thank you so much, Mr. Kelly, for that quite informative presentation. I love how we are diving into the multifacetedness of the sustainability discussions and exploring energy and how the just energy transition will come about in the Federation. So, Mr. Ward, I think the scene has been set for you to take over and do yours. Let's see what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Laplace and Jonathan also. Um, again, my name is Ian Ward, Chief Engineer at Nevlek, part of a small technical team um, that works in collaboration with Skelec um, to transition from um, fossil fuels uh, to renewable energy, and in particular the geothermal, um, which we are hoping to put into full effect by 2030. So as you can see by the map, we are strategically well positioned, close to Antigua, Guadeloupe, Anguilla, St. Martin. Um, Puerto Rico is approximately 400 kilometers northwest of the island. So we can also, at some point in time, we can um, run um, submarine cables to interconnect even as far as Puerto Rico is the layout of both islands. As you can see that we're strategically very, very close, approximately uh, five kilometers from the nearest points um, for the initial interconnection cables, submarine cables, um, that will begin the process um, of the one grid system um, that Mr. Kelly had mentioned earlier. Um, this is an initiative that the government and in particular Prime Minister is very keen to do as quickly as possible. So what we see here um, is that Nevis um, has a large renewable energy potential, um, far exceeding the local demand for power, which peaks at approximately 40 megawatts. We are told that it can produce up to one gigawatt of power at 98% capacity. In addition to this, we also have um, good um, offshore wind potential. We are told anywhere between um, 880 megawatts to um, 1,000 megawatts, one gigawatt of fixed offshore wind potential. We are also exploring solar. Um, Mr. Kelly has indicated that they are just signed a new agreement in St. Kitts for 35 megawatts of power. Um, in Nevis, we are exploring adding four megawatts of solar, um, along with five megawatt hours of um, BES. Again, we, we have 2.2 megawatts of um, onshore wind. And we are also looking at exploring ways to energy, uh, which will help to um, clear some of the ways that we have on both islands. Again, we are looking at interconnecting with islands close to us. Um, the thought pattern is that we would um, help or assist um, our neighboring islands to also reduce um, the dependence on fossil fuels. There's also opportunity for green hydrogen, which we'll speak about a little later, and the derivatives of green hydrogen, which are ammonia, fertilizer, uh, methanol, and e-fuels. So these, this is what we're looking for to potentially export and to drive a new market for, the, for St. Kitts and Nevis. And obviously we see ourselves as a model, not only for the Caribbean, but for the wider world, because we plan to do all these various technologies, solar, geothermal, wind, and so forth. 
and obviously with all these plans for um, becoming a model, we would need strategic partners to join with us in this transformation. Um, we have developed a comprehensive roadmap for transformation to a green economy based on development of renewable energy resources for local use and export. The plan is to have this implemented by the year 2030 um, when we're hopeful that the geothermal resource will be implemented. Along with that, we are looking to um, transition from overhead lines to um, underground cables and to also upgrade um, our primary voltage from 11 kV to, si to 6 kV and that is to assist with interconnecting first and foremost to both islands and then looking to expand to the islands uh, very very close to us. The government of Singapore plans to exceed its commitment to become 100% powered by renewable energy by developing its renewable energy sources to exceed local demand. Again, that is to accelerate the Power to X program, which is again to um, produce green hydrogen and other derivatives. Further, the GOSKN plans to improve the energy efficiency of the local economy and transition it to a smarter, greener economy, consistent with its sustainable development goals. In addition to this, we are looking at um, the integrated utility services, which would help us to transition um, that much quicker. Um, so there are plans afoot to um, go into government services, government buildings, and to transition from um, the older type air conditioning units to inverter types and to also um, replace um, some of the lighting um, to energy efficient um, lights. So this program is already underway and we're hoping to continue um, with this program in the next, in the next coming years. I'd like to show you now the, um, the, the roadmap to transition from fossil fuels uh, to renewable. Um, phase one, which is being phased as 1A, 1B, 1C, is to first of all drill uh, five geothermal wells, which will comprise of three production wells um, and two um, reinjection wells, and then to begin the process of going underground um, on both islands and then looking to um, go with a submarine cable to complete the initial link between St. Kitts and Nevis. And then we're saying that by 2026, which is phase two, that we'll drill an additional four reinjection wells and that we'll convert um, the two reinjection wells from the Hamilton location uh, to production wells, which will um, upgrade the Hamilton facilities from a 30 megawatt plant to a 50 megawatt plant by 2027. And then, as stated earlier, we would look to um, run another underground cable from the Hamilton location over to the Long Point location where we plan to have the um, Power to X facilities. As you can see from this map, um, the three um, areas that we've already done exploratory drilling, um, N1, N2, and N3, that was done in 2007, and then N4, which was done in 2018. Um, all, three, or all four wells produced similar results in terms of uh, temperature, we were getting uh, 250 degrees C at one kilometer. Um, and we are based on um, experts' advice that if we go down to 1.5 kilometers, we'll get to 200 
and 90 degrees Celsius. As you can see from the map, the resource is on the west coast of the island, and we believe that the resource is anywhere between 18 square kilometers and could be up to as much as 36 square kilometers. So just to drill down a little further on the phases, so phase 1A is the drilling of the five wells, that's the, that's the three production wells, and the two reinjection wells. Um, we'll see it in, in another um, slide, but there's one vertical well, drilling down one vertical well, and four directional wells. Um, the production wells will be on one pad, and then the two reinjection wells are approximately 800 meters away from um, the production wells, hence the need to drill uh, directional wells. Um, the cost to do these wells is approximately 36 million. 60 million of this will come from the CIG funds, which means that we will be able to de-risk the project somehow. Um, so if we drill and it's unsuccessful, then there's no loss of um, finances. And if we drill it and it is successful, then um, it will go to um, concessionary loans. Also in this first phase of uh, 1A, we will see um, the first um, trenching of um, cables to Cades Bay, to sorry, from Hamilton to Cades Bay, and then the submarine cable from um, Cades Bay over to Majors Bay at a cost of $6.6 .6 million. So total cost for phase 1A would be $42.6 million. Um, this is the site, the location of the production wells, uh, N5, N6, and N7. And then in the corner, we'll see uh, the reinjection wells, N8 and N9. Again, you can see that N5 will be a vertical well. That's where in the middle. And the two on the either side of that will be um, directional wells. And again, we see directional wells at um, Hamilton Stables um, for the reinjection wells. So these are the well heads that will be used um, for those projects. Um, N5 again will be the vertical well. N6, N7, N8, and N9 will be directional wells. Again, we can see the initial interconnect with St. Kitts um, there from Cades Bay over to, to Majors Bay. Uh, that link would be, um, it would be a 66 kV cable, but initially it would be energized at 11 kVs that we can uh, transport electricity over to St. Kitts um, in the initial stages. Phase 1B, we will construct the second um, 60 kV link between St. Kitts and Nevis, and also construct substations um, strategically to ensure that power is delivered over to St. Kitts. So the links will be from Hamilton to Prospect to Charlestown, that's from the, um, the geothermal resource to Prospect, which is where we are delivering power from our uh, Prospect power station, and then to Charlestown via underground cable, um, which would be the um, interconnection point over to uh, St. Kitts, Port Zante, which would be done by um, a submarine cable. Then from Port Zante, there will be, be a link to the uh, needs bus, the power station um, located in St. Kitts. So this will be the first of the line that will link all the power stations in St. Kitts and Nevis, forming a ring between the two islands. And then in three, you will see the locations of the uh, substations, which will 
um, be um, transforming transformers from 66 kV to 11 kV. That will be that will form our um, distribution um, circuits. Again, we can see the link from Charlestown over to Port Zante, which is the center of St. Kitts, and then an internal link um, between Needsmoss and um, Port Zante. The cost for, for, for phase 1B would be approximately $45.7 million, and we're hoping that that will be completed possibly in the third quarter of 20. 25. And then phase C would be the third um, transmission link between St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, again, Hamilton. Um, this time we're going the opposite direction, Spring Hill to Cavesway. That would complete the link um, in Nevis, the, loop, the initial loop circuit, not the ring circuit, but the loop circuit, which will be able to provide power to St. Kitts from two locations, one um, in Cha um, sorry, Port Zante Bastia, and the second link would be in Frigate Bay. Um, this would be the second first leg of the line that will link all power stations in St. Kitts and Nevis, forming a ring between the two islands, as well as raise the voltage of Cades Bay to Majors Bay by the submarine cable. So we'll, we'll increase or upgrade that link which was initially 11 kV to 66 kV. And at that point, we were looking to add uh, seven more substations, um, Hamilton Estate, um, Spring Hill, Cades Bay, Maddens in Nevis, and Frigate Bay, Needsmoss, and Majors Bay in St. Kitts. So phase one, um, cumulative costs would be $143.3 million. So again, we see that um, interconnection, that submarine cable from Cades Bay over to Frigate Bay, and then we'll see that, that cable that was initially um, 11 kV from Cades Bay over to the Southern Peninsula, and that also will go over to um, 66 kV from an 11 kV conductor. So again, this is the completed link, the loop, so you will see Hamilton over to the N1 site, down to the ICP, the incursion point there in Cades Bay, and then we'll also see that interconnection point in Charlestown. So one leg, as, as you can see, will go from uh, Charlestown to, K, uh, to Port Zante, and the second loop will be from Cades Bay over to Frigate Bay. This again is um, just drilling down somewhat on the addition of the four um, additional um, wells, reinjection wells um, that, that we saw earlier in the slides. So the cost of these wells would be 14.4 million um, in prospect, 14.4 million in uh, long point at a total cost of $28.8 million. So at this point, We'll transition from, as I said, from the 30 megawatt plant to the 50 megawatt plant. Uh, cumulative costs for phases um, one and two is $172.1 million. So this is the, the, the plan for the reinjection wells. So we have N11. Uh, so N10, N11, N12, and N13. And then the initial injection wells um, at Hamilton will be converted to production wells. And that is where we'll get our 50 megawatts, um, which will drive the power to X, which we'll speak about shortly. So here we go. So the, the construction of the 50 megawatt geothermal plant at Hamilton Estates. Um, the 66 kV cable um, from Prospect to Long Point that, that will supply the power to X facility. Um, construct 66 kV underground cable from Charlestown to Long Point. Again, to complete that, that ring um, between Prospect 
uh, PowerTech facility and back to Charlestown. And then um, another cable from Charlestown to Cades Bay to provide redundancy and improve voltage. So we can see at the 50 megawatt power plant, the cost would be $150 million. Additional transmission lines, uh, $12.9 million. Uh, total cost of phase three, $162.9 million. Uh, cumulative cost for phase one, phases one, two, and three, $335 million US dollars. Sorry, we're having a, a slight glitch. Something? Okay. So we're hoping that the construction of the 50 megawatt geothermal plant, the transmission cables um, would be completed by 2027. Um, he's very optimistic, but you know we are we are hopeful that things will go to plan. Um, in Saint Kitts, the soil is much softer than Nevis. We have a lot of volcanic rocks, but we're hoping that we can um, maintain uh, maintain um, schedule and complete these projects again by the third quarter of 2027. So we see the complete loop. Um, the, the, blue, the blue line um, is from Hamilton to Spring Hill at the N1 location, um, over to uh, Cades Bay, and then the link submarine cable over to Frigate Bay. The red cable is from um, Hamilton to Prospect, down to Charlestown and then over to uh, Port Zante and then we'll form a ring which will be closed there at Needsmus. Cables internally being run from uh, Frigate Bay over to Needsmus and then again from uh, Port Zante to Needsmus. And obviously there'll be substations um, connected to ensure um, safe delivery of power between the islands. Phase four would be the construction of the 20 megawatt um, power to X facility at Long Point. Um, construct the ring and substations on the island of Nevis. Um, Maddens to Indian Castle to Cox Heath. But it's also important to note that Maddens has the wind farms. We want to include that resource so that we can produce power that will flow between uh, St. Kitts and Nevis. And then a similar um, construct will happen in, um, in St. Kitts where they will have substations in Newton Ground, Sadlers, Kayon, New Road, Trinity, and New Guinea. So the cost for phase four is $170 million and cumulative cost for phases one, two, three, and four, $505 million. So we're hoping that to be completed by 2028, um, ahead of schedule, um, the 2030 schedule, which was, I think, previous prime minister had indicated that we would go 100% renewable based on the Paris Agreement by 2030. So now we can see the in interconnection points, um, which now includes the uh, power to X. This is the excess. So Mr. Kelly would have indicated earlier that we're going to be somewhere between 30 and 40 megawatts. So whatever the excess is, that will go to uh, power to X and produce the green hydrogen. Um, and the derivatives of green hydrogen, ammonia, and uh, fertilizer, and, and methanol, and e-fuels. Um, so, and then you can also see that the, the ring main is also taking shape. 
that blue line uh, that goes around the east coast and that connects uh, to the Madden's wind farm. That's also going to be our location for our first solar farm, which is a four megawatt um, solar farm and a five megawatt um, hour um, battery system. Then Sengis will begin the process of completing their ring. Um, that's outlined there in blue. And you can see that they have substations in the areas already identified um, in collaboration with Skelec. So this is, this is actually going to be the one ring, the one grid, sorry, the one grid system, which the Prime Minister had mentioned um, earlier. So we zoom out now, we see the full impact of the one grid, including the power to X. By then, we'll have the 35 megawatt solar farm, along with our wind, our wind farm potential, along with our solar, fa uh, solar farm potential in Nevis. So this now is a breakdown of the costs. 1A, phase 1A will be $42.6 million. That will include the drilling of the five wells and also the transmission lines to link um, Hamilton initially to Prospect and then over to uh, Charlestown. 1B at $45.7 million. That will include now substations and additional uh, transmission lines, 1C, um, substations and transmission lines. These are the links that will form the loop in Nevis and the submarine cables over to St. Kitts at the two locations mentioned earlier. They're in uh, Port Zante and again in Frigate Bay. Um, phase two is the construction of the 30 megawatt uh, plant um, in the Hamilton location um, and then we'll see an upgrade from that 30 megawatt plant once we have dug the, the additional four injection wells from 30 megawatts to a 50, me 50 megawatt plant um, and then the introduction of the power to X uh, with their substations and transmission lines so as, as I said the Total cost will be $505 million. Project benefits, reduced reliance on imported fossil fuels, which are subject to what we call price shocks. Um, we've seen some, some severe increases in fuel prices over the years, especially um, around the COVID time, which impacted both islands. Um, and caused prices to increase um, tremendously, which have obviously impacted um, not only the commercial side of the islands, but also the residential side of the island. It's going to create jobs. We predict that it would, do, it would create somewhere in the region of 450 jobs um, directly and somewhere around 1,000 jobs indirectly. Um, during the period of 2024 and 2028. As Jonathan mentioned, it will sti stimulate the local economy. We believe that um, industry will come back to, set to both islands um, with you know, um, inexpensive um, electricity. Number five, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution from the power sector by replacing diesel generators with clean, renewable energy sources. Number six, contribute to global efforts to combat climate change by aligning with the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. Improve the quality of life and well-being of the people of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis by providing reliable and affordable electricity to all consumers, especially low-income and vulnerable groups. 
And number eight, promote social justice and inclusion by ensuring that participation and consultation of all the stakeholders, especially the local communities. So we've already began that process. Um, we've had town hall meetings and we'll continue to have town hall meetings um, when we go into the transmission lines because that will impact persons living in certain neighborhoods. And so we want to make sure that they're part of that process, that they're included in the process. And obviously, you know, whatever questions they ask, we'll be able to answer those questions. Um, I think most people are very excited. I know in Nevis, I'm at the potential. Um, it will be life transforming. It's a, it is a game changer, and we believe that with partners that we can make this into a real success story. Thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you, Mr. Ward. And so far, we've had two lovely presentations that uh, complement our national discussions yesterday, especially surrounding energy and our just energy transition. So our last presentation will be virtual. It's going to be a pre-recorded video by Mr. Josiah Burkett, who works at the Ministry of Sustainable Development as a senior GIS officer. And he is going to let us know how GIS, which is the Geographical Information Systems, can impact climate action and help us to implement the SDGs. Hello, and welcome to our presentation on harnessing GIS for sustainable development and climate action in St. Kitts and Nevis. The summary of this presentation includes an introduction, looking at GIS linked to the SDGs and climate change, St. Kitts and Nevis's goal of developing a national spatial data infrastructure, the importance of the NSDI, NSDI implementation, data-driven decision-making, examples of GIS benefits, a roadmap and call for partnerships and support, and then we conclude. What is GIS? Geographical Information Systems is a system that creates manages, analyzes, and maps all type of data. It links spatial data where to the attributes of that data. Here in this image, we see different GIS layers. Here we have street data, then we have buildings data, we have vegetation data, and when all overlaid, we have integrated data. GIS linked to the SDGs because it plays a crucial role in achieving the sustainable development goals and combating climate change by enabling effective spatial planning, resource management, informed decision making, through the analysis and visualization of geospatial data. So in the context of climate change and the SDGs, the importance of data-driven decisions cannot be overstated. Such decisions ensure precise insights allowing for targeted interventions and efficient resource allocation ultimately leading to impactful and sustainable outcomes. For instance, data-driven climate models can guide resilient infrastructure planning, contributing to both environmental sustainability and the SDG 9, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. GIS and climate change. GIS facilitates climate data analysis by visualizing trends and aiding in resilient infrastructure planning. For example, climate data analysis. So GIS plays a crucial role in climate change mitigation and adaptation by providing tools to analyze and visualize geospatial data. It aids in identifying vulnerable areas, assessing climate risk, and planning resilient infrastructure. GIS also supports decision-making for sustainable resource management, helping communities adapt to changing environmental conditions and mitigate the impact of climate change. St. Kitts and Nevis's vision, National Spatial Data Infrastructure, or NSDI. The NSDI is a framework that facilitates the organization, sharing, and accessibility of spatial data within a country. Its goal is to enhance decision-making, support various applications, and foster collaboration among different stakeholders. As identified, there are about eight goals that you can achieve with the NSDI. These include effective geospatial information management, increased capacity and knowledge transfer, 
integrated GIS services, economic return on investment, sustainable education and programs, international cooperation and partnerships, enhanced national engagement and communication, and enriched societal value benefits. In the context of climate change goals under the SDGs, an NSDI could facilitate interoperability by integrating climate-related data sets. For, for instance, carbon emission information and vulnerability maps could be shared seamlessly among environmental agencies. This interoperability enhances the accuracy of climate change assessments, supporting collaborative efforts to develop effective mitigation and adaptation strategies aligned with SDGs such as the SDG 13 climate action, for example. The importance of a NSDI. As identified, an NSDI saves time and money. It facilitates data sharing. It reduces data redundancy. And it's a centralized data sharing platform. The National Spatial Data Infrastructure in St. Kitts and Nevis can enhance dec decision making by providing a unified platform for comprehensive geospatial data. This fosters disaster resilience through informed planning, helps optimize resource efficiency by enabling targeted resource allocation, and supports sustainable development initiatives through a holistic understanding of the island's spatial dynamics. Some of these benefits include societal benefits, improving the lives of citizens, economic benefits, the average estimated global impact of GIS is in order of 0.2% of the global GDP, and environmental benefits, sustainable management of environment relies on geospatial information. NSDI implementation strategy. So the implementation guide provided is used to provide oversight and develop and follow up on a country level action plans through indicators that include geospatial information at a national as well as subnational level. So this was established from the UNGGIM Integrated Geospatial Information Framework and it's anchored by nine strategic pathways. The framework is a mechanism for articulating and demonstrating national leadership in geospatial information and the capacity to take positive steps. So this implementation strategy can be fostered through drivers for change. These include benefits, which are key drivers for change as many socioeconomic and environmental benefits can be measured and demonstrate a return on investment to make a compelling business case. You also have strategic alignment to global agendas. You have transforming government. GIS promotes evidence-based decision-making and in doing so reduces costs to government. It stimulates opportunities including efficient citizen-centric government activities. Drivers for change include bridging the digital divide. GIS can give government business and communities the opportunity to improve efficiency and encourage innovation. There are two types of outcomes for all developing states currently. Institutions can be left behind and governments become reactive to challenges and change, or countries can leapfrog other institutions and competitors using advanced cost-effective methods to bridge the digital divide and deliver benefits as well as manage assets and risk. Establishing a foundation for climate action. It is important to understand that the NSDI and GIS forms a powerful foundation for climate action by enabling data-driven decision-making, enhancing spatial analysis capabilities, and fostering collaboration among diverse stakeholders in the pursuit of sustainable and resilient solutions to climate challenges. It allows informed decision making. So an example of how climate data through GIS can assist in informed decision making includes scenario planning. With GIS data, we can model different climate scenarios for St. Kitts and Nevis, including projecting potential effects of rising sea levels on coastal areas or natural disaster scenarios such as tsunami high-risk areas. At the high level, stakeholders need to understand what data-driven decision-making is and how it can be effectively used, especially in the case of strategic planning. And on this slide, we have an example from BSC, which is a software that assists with data-driven decision-making. 
and through the different steps, you can identify how data is key in making decisions, including understanding context, including visualizing, including an action plan and prioritizing decisions, executing and analyzing the results. At the end of this, you have a learning loop and data is at the foundation of all these key steps. Climate impact awareness. So here we have an image of tsunami hazard zone in St. Kitts and Nevis, and it's in the dark blue. This is an example of how climate data through GIS can assist in informed decision making, which includes scenario planning. So with GIS data, we can model different climate scenarios for St. Kitts and Nevis, including projecting potential effects of rising sea level on coastal areas or natural disaster scenarios such as tsunami high-risk areas. The NSDI enables strengthening of other departments. So how can the NSDI and GIS benefit other departments? Well, it can benefit through disease mapping, as we saw with COVID-19, how important GIS and mapping and contact tracing was. It helps with precision farming, as many sustainable islands or small island developing states are trying to improve food security. Precision farming plays a major role and GIS enables this through remote sensing, data analysis, and quantifying effects of climate change on agriculture. Urban planning, with many countries experiencing urbanization, we need to understand how this urbanization can impact the quality of life of those who use urban areas or reside in urban areas. And disaster preparedness, as in an example shown in the image, Grenada had a digital twin made of their island. And here we see a twin of the Grenada Harbor with a two meter sea level rise and how it would impact various businesses and buildings and communities. Demonstrating impact examples, how GIS driven decisions have positively impacted sustainability in other regions and presents potential for similar cases in St. Kitts. We have land use planning in Singapore. With limited lands and a large population, land management is key and GIS is assisting Singapore in this challenge. Water resource management in California. California has managed water, particularly water quality using GIS. Disaster response in Japan. Japan has used GIS in 2011, particularly with their nuclear disaster to deploy medical teams. And in Germany, renewable energy planning. Germany has an interactive atlas available to the public that lets researchers, investors, and other stakeholders quickly and easily vi visualize biomass potential on national and regional levels in Germany. Because bioenergy contributes approximately two thirds of the renewable energy system in Germany, it represents an essential option for balancing the very volatile renewable energy sources that contribute to the German power supply system. Here we have a roadmap of where we were, where we are, and where we can go as a twin island federation. In the past, there was limited to no spatial data available. Presently, there has been improvements, and we have some spatial data available, but still various gaps, especially in baseline data sets. Now, through the NSDI, we can have a future where we have complete data sets and models, particularly baseline data, and the establishment of a national GIS database. So now, what we are seeking is funding, assistance, and partnerships for the NSDI. St. Kitts and Nevis is currently seeking funding and opportunities that can assist with accomplishing the development of an NSDI as well as support that can bolster geospatial initiatives such as data collection focused on improving sustainable development and combating climate change. Some of the opportunities we are exploring include international organizations such as the World Bank, the United Nations Development Program, the Inter-American Development Bank, GEF, climate focused funding, government grants such as national grants and initiatives, public private partnership, so collaboration with the private sector entities that can attract funding and expertise for NSDI implementation, research grants, climate innovation funds, technology grants, and regional development. 
we are open to partnerships. We are open to collaboration in order to drive the NSDI for St. Kitts and Nevis. Once we have an NSDI developed, we want it to be sustainable and we want it to continuously grow and improve. And this can happen through public-private partnerships, through user fees and subscriptions, through grant funding, through cost sharing with stakeholders, and through capacity building services. Again, to reiterate, the economic benefits that we can get from an NSDI includes efficient resource allocation, risk mitigation and disaster management, improved decision making, enhanced infrastructure planning, supporting economic growth, and tourism development. So to conclude, GIS through the NSDI is a pillar in driving sustainable development and climate action. The goal is to implement an NSDI. We are seeking funding to support and bolster our GIS. The national GIS and NSDI can strengthen multiple departments and the government and various impacts and benefits through data-driven decisions, as well as long-term growth. So thank you for listening to my presentation. If you have any questions or interests, my information is below and you can reach out to us. I want to thank Mr. Burkett for his contribution. And I love that we continue to expand the uh, sustainability conversations and get into the more technical information related to sustainability and transitioning to a sustainable island state. I want to thank both Mr. Kelly and Mr. Ward from the electricity companies in both St. Kitts and Nevis, respectively. They gave us very in-depth uh, discussions on how we are transitioning and how we are uh, transitioning energetically as a federation. And so I am appreciative of both of you for your contributions. Thank you for attending both those looking on at home. Those looking on at home and those of you who are present here today. So I want to know if the floor has any questions. Do you, does anyone have any questions? No, I think the, the presentations were quite comprehensive. Thank you all for coming. And this concludes our sustainability discussions and today's national technical presentation on strategizing sustainability. Thank you. Thank you.